penal de Veníamos con el video y ya después subís. No. Sí, te puedes parar. Private Banking es la plataforma que tiene BAC para sus clientes más importantes, en donde a través de un círculo de confianza logramos gestionar y maximizar el patrimonio de nuestros clientes. A través de un servicio y una oferta diferenciada, aseguramos que logren sus propósitos y los de sus familias. Nos estamos convirtiendo en una banca más humana, más cercana a nuestros clientes y más consciente de las necesidades que ellos tienen, ofreciéndoles soluciones simples, digitales y sostenibles que buscan mejorar su experiencia. Para esto, estamos rediseñando nuestra propuesta de valor a través de la escucha a nuestros clientes y colaboradores para estar cada vez más cerca de ellos y entender sus necesidades. ¿Cómo impacta Private Banking en la vida de nuestros clientes y de las empresas? Yo creo que impacta de varias maneras. Eh, la primera es el círculo de confianza que generamos para que los clientes se acerquen a nosotros eh, y nos puedan hablar sobre sus inversiones, sobre sus planes, sobre lo que buscan para su familia. Eh, y nosotros pues poder de alguna manera darles esas soluciones y esa tranquilidad. ¿Cómo nos estamos transformando? Escuchando al cliente, poniendo al cliente al centro, revisando siempre las oportunidades de mejora, y sobre todo digitalizando. Como punto de apoyo y de gestión de las principales relaciones que tiene BAC a nivel regional, nuestra importancia en el acompañamiento de las familias, de las principales familias que tenemos como clientes, es en acompañarlos también en cómo generar prosperidad a través de las operaciones, no solo de BAC, sino de la huella que estas grandes familias dejan en la región. Agradecemos a nuestros clientes de Private Banking por pertenecer a este círculo de confianza y permitirnos ser parte de sus vidas, de sus familias y de sus empresas para generar prosperidad en la región. Somos su círculo seguro de confianza. Gracias por ser parte de Private Banking. Muy buenas tardes. Hola, hola. Buenas tardes a todos. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Nos sentimos sumamente agradecidos y complacidos de tenerlos con nosotros. Y también, pues, queremos, por supuesto, agradecer muchísimo al profesor Subramanian Rangan eh, por estar aquí en Costa Rica y poder unirse junto con, con los otros países, uh, gracias a la magia de la tecnología, poder compartir qué es lo que está pasando, cuál es el estado del arte en términos de estrategia y, por supuesto, todo aquello que es relevante para ustedes. Si me permite, me gustaría hacer una breve introducción del profesor Rangan. Él tiene un MBA de MIT Sloan School of Management, tiene un doctorado en Political Economy de Harvard University y su investigación ha estado enfocada en cuál es el futuro del capitalismo, o sea, algo muy, muy relevante, y cómo las empresas y sus empresas pueden integrar el desempeño y el progreso. En el año 2013, el profesor Rangan creó eh, una, una iniciativa que se, que se llama Society for Progress. Es un grupo de filósofos, de científicos sociales y de líderes del, del mundo, del sector privado, muy destacados y de todas partes del mundo. 
El profesor Rangan es profesor de estrategia en INSEAD, yo diría la escuela de negocios más destacada de Europa. Y me llamó la atención mucho cuando, por ejemplo, leí el libro de Blue Ocean Strategy y los autores agradecían al profesor Rangan por todas las contribuciones que él había hecho en, en su investigación. Ha escrito dos libros, los últimos, eh, el primero en esta, en esta sociedad se llama Performance and Progress y son ensayos acerca del capitalismo, los negocios y la sociedad. Y el último, que se denomina Capitalismo más allá de la mutualidad, que ofrece perspectivas en la integración de la filosofía y las ciencias sociales. Además, el profesor Rangan es miembro de la Junta Directiva del Foro Económico Mundial y de la Fundación Schwab, asesor de múltiples CEOs alrededor del mundo, en Europa, en Asia, obviamente en Estados Unidos, eh, asesor del príncipe de Abu Dhabi, así que podemos preguntarle qué está pasando. Ayer me estaba compartiendo eh, que están trabajando en cuál es la estrategia de Abu Dhabi para el siglo XXII, que me parece simplemente apasionante. Y por supuesto, un líder académico a nivel global, eh, creo que muchos premios Nobel de economía, de filosofía, lo respetan y, y lo escuchan. Así que para nosotros es un privilegio tenerlos a ustedes con nosotros acá y por supuesto tener al profesor Rangan. So thank you so much, Professor Rangan, for being with us. We're honored and grateful to have you here and uh, ready to listen to your wisdom. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? <clears throat> I hear a car that is backing up and endlessly. Um, I don't know which car is trying to park, and, but I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Thank you. Phil studied computer science, and he has the same homework that I had in 1980. And the only difference, he has data. We didn't. We just had the algorithms. Now, AI has been in the... We've been talking about AI for almost 50 years. Nobody expected ChatGPT. And suddenly here it is. Now in China, Baidu has launched a large language model. So the world changes more quickly than central planning can accommodate. And so that idea of planned economy and command and control has been abandoned. Even China has embraced a variety of capitalism, the Middle East. India, South America, Central America. So this idea has spread. And what we have today is an incredibly successful world economy, which this year is at $105 trillion is the world GDP, which means for 8 billion people, almost $13,000 to $14,000 per capita. This is crazy to think that the world average per capita GDP today is $14,000. Now, of course, there are poor countries and very poor people in India has a still maybe 200, 300 million people who are in absolute poverty. So this 13, 14,000 is not the median. The median would be lower. But the point I'm making is capitalism has delivered on the goal of economic prosperity. However, what we have suddenly come to see is that there is a cost to this. And I want to share with you an image that might try and um, get at this. Essentially, human beings are part of <clears throat> four systems. The first one being the biosystem. We come from the biosystem. Our planet Earth is about 400 and a half billion years old. Life on land started about 400 million years ago. So life on planet Earth started 4 billion years ago, we think. So very soon after the planet Earth was formed. And then on land 400 million years ago. And then we got the fungi and the trees and so on, and we got oxygen. And life, as we know, could start. Homo sapiens, our species, 
is estimated about 200 to 300,000 years ago. So our story starts with the biosystem. And then the first system that humans created is what we refer to as the cultural system. And among the early dimensions of this cultural system was religion. Slightly earlier was the academy. You can imagine that the academy studies started with astrology. If I ask you what is your zodiac sign, almost all of you will know your zodiac sign. This is 7,000 years old. And we still think. So the academy started with astrology and today is much more elaborated. Of course, the arts exist also. Today we have media and sports and other dimensions of the cultural system. This influences humanity. Another system that we created which influences humanity is, of course, the political system. Now, we come from the biosystem, but why did we create the cultural system? Why did we create the political system? Because when we started, and this game, this cultural system, etc., starts about 10,000 years ago. So quite recent compared to the biosystem, quite recent compared to the origin of humans. And why did we create these systems? Because when humans started to live together in groups of 100 or more, we encountered a new problem for the first time. This is called the problem of interdependence. And cultural systems, political systems, these are all addressing our, they are to regulate our interdependence. Because if human society is to have stability and is to have some kind of flourishing, we need to coordinate and we need to cooperate. And we need to regulate interdependence. Interdependence is a chronic problem. So we created the cultural system. And we created then the political system. The political system regulates our civic interdependence. And the crowning glory of human systems was about 400 years ago when we created the modern economic system. So 4 billion years ago, life starts on planet Earth. 400 years ago, we create a system called the economic system, the market system. The economic system emerged about a thousand years ago in the UK. And basically, when you start surplus production, you don't produce for yourself, you produce for the market. And then you start to have financial instruments, you start to have, you have elaborated markets. That's the economic system. And this economic system has succeeded incredibly. And so today we are at 103 or $105 trillion global GDP, $13,000 to $14,000 per capita income. But this economic system has declined in trust. People say this economic system called capitalism is delivering progress, but in a very uneven way. And the first thing is, it's not fair. How can we have 200,000 millionaires in California and 200,000 homeless people in California? How do we understand that the concentration of wealth is so extreme and rising? And so people are saying, let's abolish billionaires. Let's not just have a minimum wage, let's have a maximum wage. Let's not pay CEOs 10 million they are not million times more productive than the median worker. You've heard all of this. And so the economic system is seen as unfair and the economic system is also seen as distracting us from the real thing. And the real thing is not the wealth, but the well-being. You see, it's a little secret that all of you know. If you're in this room, you understand what is wealth. But you understand, therefore, that wealth cannot buy well-being. There is no market for well-being. You have to produce it. And so somebody said, you know, money may be the currency of the economy. 
time is the currency of life. And if you don't know how to manage, because well-being, well-being comes from relationships. Well-being comes from relationships. Relationship with yourself, relationship with your friends and family, relationship with nature, relationship with future, and relationship with past. But relationships need time. If you use all your time to make money, you will not have well-being. And so wealth can displace well-being. We see that with bankers. And so suddenly the economic system is seen as it has some toxic side effects. Markets are efficient, but not sufficient. If the goal of the economy is to create not just output, but outcomes and well-being is an outcome, then the market is not succeeding. So partly we could say, but these things like fairness or worse, you know, for the economy to succeed, it has had to exploit the biosystem severely. There is no modern economy without energy. We cannot have this iPad. We cannot have noisy technology. Without electricity, none of this is going to happen. We cannot have chat GPT without electricity or blockchain, let alone mining bitcoins. And I was saying, you know, to make a chess move for a human brain is three calories, for a computer is 3,000 calories. So the more people using ChatGPT, you cannot imagine the servers, how they've expanded and how the energy footprint of that is coming. And so until now, now in the future, we will have, let's say, green hydrogen, or there will be other new ways to produce renewable energy and decouple the carbon from the energy needs of the economy. But today, and the development of the West of 2 billion people has been made on fossil energy. And the biosystem is in very, very great stress. Any indicator you want to look at the biosystem, whether it's temperature, whether it's forest fires, whether it is soil quality, the desertification. You know, if you have less than 2% organic matter, soil is sand, and that's what's happened. And all the fish have been taken out of the ocean. As the world gets rich, as the Chinese and the Indians and everyone else who was not rich gets rich, we consume more. And one of the first things we consume is animal protein. And that has a huge footprint. Now, we cannot tell the Chinese, don't eat meat. Indians, you should all be vegetarian. Only about less than 20% of Indians are vegetarian. And as incomes rise, clothing, housing, so the material needs of humanity is putting a huge, and we're going to 10 billion people with rising incomes, rising population, rising. This is a huge, huge stress on biodiversity, on species, on nature, basically. And so today, we have COP28. Is anything going to happen because it's held in Dubai? You know, 28 times we've had a conference on the planet. I'm not very optimistic. Because the real problem is not, you know, to a certain extent, that's the political system saying, we will help the biosystem. But in fact, the economic system has already captured the political system. In Central America, in Asia, in South America, and in North America. In Asia, we call it corruption. In North America, they call it lobbying. It's the same thing. That's why the joke is the United States has the best government money can buy. We know how expensive elections are. We know how positions are taken on which energy policy to follow. And what will be the price of carbon? All of these. Should marijuana be legal? Should g online gambling be legal? What should be the tax rate on estates? All of these are political policies which are shaped today by the wealthy actors. And this is why there is no trust in wealth. Because wealth that is concentrated is just another form of power. And the way that power is being projected, if Jeff Bezos goes somewhere or Elon Musk 
he can meet any prime minister or president in the world. This is the power of wealth. And people see this. People see this, and so there is no trust in the political system. So three of our systems that we depend on, that got us here, are now on very unstable grounds. People are awaiting, to mean conflict before climate change. And people are thinking, is the conflict going to be geopolitical or is it going to be civil war inside countries? The French Revolution. We think ISIS was brutal. The French Revolution was more brutal than ISIS. And it was about the unfairness. I was talking to a friend who's a chairman of big companies in Europe. He was himself a great CEO. And he was saying, Subi, the Iranian Revolution and the French Revolution happened because the economy was not fair and the wealthy did not care. Think about it. The French Revolution, the Iranian Revolution happened because the economy was not fair and the wealthy did not care. You know this. You know the building of bunkers. You know the purchase of houses in New Zealand. This is plan B for the super wealthy. And what's the hope? So as someone who cares, I grew up in India thinking, wow, development, prosperity, government, etc. And now as a strategy professor, I really think firms are the best technology we've ever created. And the private sector and individual entrepreneurship is the best idea we had. So I'm really pro-business, but I think it's time for enterprises basically to engage more. And I don't think, unfortunately, religion is helping us. Politicians have taken religion. Pope Francis, five years ago, he said, you know, I'm going to reform capitalism. Today, he's mostly in a wheelchair and he's like, you know, I'm not, this is not going to even God may not be able to help. I have my own problems in the church and um, he's traveling to Mongolia, kind of maybe sightseeing or something. The arts are doing okay. Media, of course, has lost too much credibility because of money and it's become infotainment, whether it is the Facebooks or whether it is the Twitters or um, X, etc. The academy remains a silent black box. We have not done our job. We have built our careers. There is so much more research, but not much of it is relevant for the problems that we're facing today. And this is why we're paid, but we've not done our research. How do we reform this economic system? Are we going to go for regulation or are we going to go for education. I believe smart regulation is useful, whether it is for green hydrogen or let's say the many transitions that we have coming, the demographic transition, the digital transition, the energy transition, the geopolitical transition. There's a lot of transitions happening. We are in the transition era. The next 25 years will be transition era. And smart regulation will surely help. But my bet is better education is a stronger response if we want to reform the economy. We don't want to throw the economy out. It's a phenomenal system. We don't want to throw enterprises out, nor do we want to throw entrepreneurship out. But it's not how much money you make. It's how you make the money. And if we can rethink how we make the money, and so you know the game rock, paper, scissors. The economy is like the rock and culture is like the paper. This is our only hope. And what I do is to try and see, as a strategy professor, how can we help firms and the leaders and the owners of firms, in fact, all economic actors, investors, consumers, consumers have to play a role in this transition. We cannot just expect firms will save the world. And the research I do then is on trying to understand how can we move this and 
I'm hoping that MBA will come to stand for Masters in Better Alternatives, not Business Administration. When I got my MBA, it was Business Administration. Today we need better alternatives. And the, the one other point I would make is, I think the world is ready, companies are ready, and the hope and the idea is that, you know, we've chosen a model where we have two axes, for and by, and we had two actors, either a people or the state, for the people, individuals, or for the collective. And we had some archetypal models. A major one is what is called the liberal model, which is by the people, for the people. That's the United States, that's the UK, that's Australia, Canada, New Zealand. All the Anglo countries follow the liberal model, by the people, for the people. A much bigger archetype is called the statist, by the state, for the people. The state will do the education, the state will do the housing, the state will do the health, the state will do the infrastructure, state will do the security, state will do retirement planning, the state for the people. France is a successful statist economy. Singapore is a little bit statist. Italy, Greece, India, Brazil, many parts of this world, Latin America, is statist by the state for the people. And then we have a model called corporatist, which is by the people for the collective. And as you might imagine, that is Northern Europe. Germany and Nordic countries are by the people for the collective. And finally, we have China, which is in that Northeast quadrant, which is corporatist, statist, by the state for the collective. That's China. And today what we see is the status model is no longer delivering. And so we want to privatize less by the state. And the liberal model is not delivering either, and they want more state. In one case, we're privatizing. In the other case, we're nationalizing. If you look at the United States, government is much more muscular now. That's why the US debt is like 30 trillion. They want to build chips and they want to build uh, energy transition. They want to fund this, they want to fund that. We need more government for COVID and um, for retraining and et cetera, et cetera. Build back better. The missing piece in this, the silent actor here is enterprise. Enterprise has been here for the enterprise, by the people, by the enterprise, and by the state. And what we need in this century urgently is enterprise to stand up. Enterprise for the people, enterprise for enterprise, and enterprise for the collective. And this is the idea of enterprise engagement. We don't need more government, we need more enterprise. And what does that mean? That means enterprises have to kind of understand that yes, they're going to focus on their performance, but they also have to focus on progress. What is the role of government? The role of government is peace, not performance, not progress. We cannot say, okay, government focuses on peace, enterprise focuses on performance, and NGOs focus on progress. Why not? What are NGOs doing? Unfortunately, government has a business model. It's called taxes. Government can raise money through taxes. 
business has a business model, it's called revenues. NGOs don't have a business model. It's called volunteers and donations. It's not scalable, not sustainable. So NGOs can provoke us, but they don't have the resources. They don't have the creativity. They don't have the competence. And therefore, the thing that I work on, what the Society for Progress focuses on, is this idea of integration. How can we integrate performance and progress? And I won't go much into it, excepting to say progress refers to fairness, progress refers to well being. So whatever business you're in, could be real estate, could be agribusiness, could be banking, are you doing it fairly? Where in your business could you improve the fairness with which you make your wealth? Second, does your business promote well-being? For example, in the 20th century, families became, we educated women, we had dual careers, and families became work-centric. Fertility rates are going down. Divorce rates are going up. Mental health is going down. We produced wealth, but we did not produce well-being. We produced wealth maybe at the expense of well-being unintentionally. Nobody intended to destroy and create ill-being, but that's what we did. We made families work-centric. In the 21st century, we need to make work family-centric. Are you doing that in your bit? What does that mean? And it's not about female, it's about families. If we want gender parity, we have to focus on families and caring. Elder care, child care, every kind of caring is still gendered, highly gendered. We need to change that. And it's not gonna happen in high schools, it's gonna happen at the workplace. This is, you know, what happens in schools is teaching. Learning happens at work. Teaching happens at school. So enterprises being engaged in more fairness, whether it's in salaries, whether it is in animal welfare, whether it is in the way you pay taxes or don't pay taxes. And thirdly, sustainability. Right. And the key thing that I find is that traditionally, in business, we thought it was all about decisions. And decisions are super important. Resource allocation decisions, that's what leaders do. They make decisions on allocating resources. And we teach them how to do that rationally. And there are so many Nobel laureates in decision science today. Decision science is a well-established field. But what I realize is that if we want progress, it's not about decisions. It's about choices. We have four brains. We have a cognitive brain, the heart brain, the gut brain, and the moral brain. We make decisions with the cognitive brain. We make choices with our other three brains. We have neurons in the heart. We have neurons in the gut. We have neurons everywhere. Now we understand that that's why the gut biome and the gut brain vagus nerve link is very important. And we realize that decisions are about information. But today we realize choices are about identity, not information. So, for example, a fashion designer like Stella McCartney. Stella McCartney says, I want cruelty-free fashion. That's a choice. It's not a decision. It's not because she knows this will sell more. She says, why should we have cruelty to animals? I'll give you nice shoes or a nice bag. It will look like a beautiful material, but it's made from mushroom or something. It's plant-based. I will not use animal leather, right? Tata in India, Tata, 150 years 
no corruption. Why? Corruption pays. Everybody else is doing it. This is not who I am. And the identity we're talking about is your moral identity. What does your family name stand for? What is the identity? I still need to make money, but how I make money will be shaped by my identity. It's a choice. Apple, for example. This is the biggest, most costly choice any company has ever made. Apple has chosen not to use a targeted advertising business model. Google uses it, now Netflix, LinkedIn, everybody uses targeted advertising. It's the data world. Apple has all the data. Google makes $80 billion a year with the ad-based model. Apple has the capabilities to do it. The market cap they are leaving on the table is $1 trillion. But Apple says, we will make money, we will be the most valuable company, but not by at the cost of privacy. What is the price of, I don't care about the cost, this is not who we are. We will not have a business model that supports pornography. Pornography is a huge business. It is the best way to monetize all the bandwidth and 5G and haptic and tomorrow virtual or blended reality. Apple will not support any business, nor will it get into that. So it's not how much money, it's how they make the money. And the key thing here, what it means for, so if I were to underline one more thing, decisions, you know, when we make decisions, we want to minimize risk. When we make choices, we want to minimize regret. Take risk, minimize regret. Take risk. That's what Elon Musk does. We see in SpaceX and sends up a thing that blows up and there's a lot of risk in that business. But he says we need a planet B. Um, now, the last couple of comments I want to make here are in the traditional model, which was focused on performance, the key thing we looked in human capital, we looked for what we call competence. If we want progress, it's not competence that we need in human capital, it's character. The world is suffering today not because we don't have enough competence. The world is suffering because we don't have enough character in the people who are the elites. The elites are the powerful, the wealthy, and the high religious order. And this is the education challenge that I'm working on. So we started a course this year. This year we launched three or four new courses in the MBA. The first course I launched about four years ago was called IPP, Integrating Performance and Progress. How do you do it practically in a real business so that you are proud of your financial performance and you are proud of your contribution to progress? So this was the first course and the base is moral philosophy. So I teach that with philosophers and CEOs who are doing this. So many of you may know the FIFCO CEO Ramon Bendiola. So Ramon comes to um, animate this course with me. Another course that we started this year for the first time is called C2C, Choosing to Care and Caring to Choose. This is founded on moral psychology. Why should you care about, and what should you care about, by the way? Firstly, why should you care beyond your own family and friends or your own country? Where does caring come from? Caring is the first part of character. Okay? It's the first part of character. And we are saying character is a skill just like competence. We can teach it. But we need better theories, different theories. It's not going to be economics. It's not going to be law. It's going to be moral psychology and trying to understand what is my moral identity. So the final exam question in this is, what is your moral identity? And if given a chance, people actually are able to reflect on that. And that can shape how they act, how they, what sacrifices they are willing to make. 
Another course that we started for the first time is called Thoughtful Consumption. There are big five things all of us are consuming, food, apparel, housing, mobility, and technology. If each of us can be more thoughtful in our chronic consumption of these five things, food is 25% of the carbon footprint in the world. Food waste is unbelievable. Unbe I do it myself this morning. You know, in a buffet, you go, in France, everything, as you know, is usually served. This is it. If you want more, you'll order another dish, but you're not going to get usually the buffet. But we waste. South Korea has eliminated food waste. It's an incredible, it's possible to do that. And the, so, apparel, 25%. Water footprint, carbon, 25%. Fast fashion. Buying and in six months to one year landfill. We don't need to do that. We can choose different model than fast fashion. We can be stylish without being wasteful and having closets full of stuff that Mary Kondo is going to organize for us. We don't need that, right? Same thing with housing. How big the houses are. The average size of family has gone down. The average size of houses has gone up. That is a lot of energy and electricity. There's a lot of materials, and that is creating a status competition. Is your palace bigger than my palace? Or we can be thoughtful about it. If you choose, it's a different style. Okay? Same thing with mobility and um, technology. We're becoming addicted to phones and screens, and then we talk of mental health. So integrating performance and progress choosing to care, caring to choose, thoughtful consumption. The final course we launched this year is well-being at work. How do you create well-being at work? <coughs> All of these courses, the students are finally, you know, when I first started, hardly anybody wanted to take these courses. Today, they're oversold. And we put no limit. Normally, the limit is 48 students, and then we stop. We take because I'm teaching with others, we cannot offer it two or three times. We say, and if you 100 people want to take it, no problem, we will accommodate you. And now, what do I... And, and next year, we will offer another new course, which is on labor adjustment. How are we going to create one billion jobs in the new sector called the quaternary sector? <coughs> Today, Nearly two and a half billion people work in the tertiary sector, the service sector. With AI, we will have one billion people who don't need to work in that sector. Where will they go? Universal basic income, no chance. Where is, there is no free money. We can't pay people to not work. We have to create the quaternary sector. And that's an incredible, so the course will be on labor adjustment. How will we adjust the labor market? <coughs> the labor market is the worst market compared to product market, financial market, etc. The labor market is a very improper market. We need theoretical innovation in the labor market. We worry about inflation, we should be worried about employment. And I tell you, the main thing there is education, but it is adult education not K through 12. In the next years, budgets for adult education will be bigger than K through 12 education. We need to reskill. But where is that reskilling going to happen? Not at universities. It's going to happen in the enterprise. So the main message is, you know, as wealth manager, I mean, as affluent families, people talk about wealth management, but I think it's time to shift to <coughs> wealth engagement. What is the idea here? <coughs> Pardon me. If you're a wealthy family, of course you care about the conservation of that, <coughs> of the money. Of course you care about the proper transmission of that wealth to the family. 
of course you care about the fun you can have with that whether it's buying art having second third fourth homes or a yacht or a private jet or a car collection but there is also the future it can't be just about funds and family that's wealth management funds and family how do i maximize my funds and how do i transmit it tax efficiently to my family that's the 20th century if we want to move from wealth management to wealth engagement we need these other dimensions and i would urge you to think where are you on a scale of 1 to 10 how do you think about wealth is it just from the funds or from and the family what's important is not just the wealth but the cohesion of the family and the next generation you know they care about the future they care about being part of the solution not part of the problem it's not rocket science enterprises are the best platform for a better future not bigger governments not much more regulation or enforcement or bigger taxes we don't need that we can tackle you know if you want ai to become bi which is beneficial intelligence what matters is the technologist not the technology if enterprises can reorient on integration then wealth will actually cause well-being rather than be seen as something that is detracting from well-being and we need to integrate wealth and well-being we need to integrate competence and character we need to integrate performance and progress and therefore to me it's the big and sign here it's not the or sign and if we can engage the wealth in a sensible way you will create something which is very important you know in the past we focused on natural capital and human capital these were the two main factors of production land and labor some families here might have started there with land land was the most important source of wealth even today it is for many people wealthy families <coughs> eventually we created machines and factories and we created physical capital to finance which we created financial markets and financial capital this was the classic production function then in the 20th century we created intellectual capital <coughs> and this became such a game changer the most valuable companies became intellectual capital companies the Siemens, the GEs, the Johnson and Johnsons, the IBM. IBM is the most patented company in the world. That's where the wealth and the valuations went. You know, Saudi Aramco, natural capital, intellectual capital, um, and physical capital, of course. So natural capital still matters. <coughs> Excuse me. In this century, we're creating a new capital called cyber capital this is the promise of digital toyota is a physical capital company is a human capital company tesla is a cyber capital company the valuations the most high valuations in the world today are cyber capital companies but cyber capital comes from this technology and by the way intellectual capital is about R to D, research to development. Cyber capital is A to D, analog to digital. Placing sensors, our whole world is analog. We can make it digital. We can make tremendous scalable services and businesses from that. Okay. But if we want to adopt cyber capital and not be scared of it, we also need to develop moral capital. 
And this is the invitation I make to you. Adopt cyber capital, but create moral capital. These are the two big capitals in this century. And we've just started on cyber capital, AI, etc. We already talk about transhumanism. Cells with silicon. Elon Musk with the neural link company that he's creating. This is an exciting century for health, for science, for advance. But you know, AI versus BI, it's not technology, it's a technologist. We will need to integrate moral capital with cyber capital. Facebook failed, and so people don't trust Facebook. China invested in cyber capital, but not in, people don't trust China. They don't want Huawei. They, they want to boycott TikTok or not use, etc. So the invitation I make to you is use your business as a platform. Don't do philanthropy. Use your business is the best platform for your contribution. You can have positive income and positive impact. You just need to make sure that your managers and you, if you're the decision makers, are also making choices, not just decisions. And then you can measure that and monetize that. This is not the, the, the problem. And I think many of you may already be doing this, but we're moving from this idea of pure economic value to something called true value. And this is an exciting new frontier. Um, companies like Tata, Apple, I think already understand this. And these are public companies. As private companies, you have even more discretion. Public companies, often it's OPM, other people's money. So you have to go two steps forward, one step back, like BlackRock is doing. As private companies, it's your choice. If you do it prudently, you will create wealth and well-being. You will make more proud families, not just prosperous offspring. You want proud families, and this is your choice. This is your choice. I don't know whether there will be civil war, whether we will have bunkers, etc. Many people think Donald Trump is just the early, the canary in the coal mine, that things are not going well. And I think this is a great time to make that choice, partly to minimize regret and partly because we can um, we're, we're ready and the academy is coming slowly, but it is coming. Usually theory follows practice. What you do inspires us. So this is my plea to you. Please engage your wealth. Don't just manage your wealth. Thank you. Let me stop here and take comments. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rangan. Maybe we have like five minutes for questions. Sure from the audience, you just can raise your hand. And we have 75 people engaged in this conversation from other Central American countries. So maybe we can take a few questions here and then one from the rest of the virtual world. Don't be shy. Thank you so much for the presentation. I just have a question regarding the moral capital. Any uh, indicators that you have been working on it that you can share with us? So this is a <clears throat> very, very nascent project and idea. And we're trying to work on indicators for both cyber capital and moral capital. How do you measure the cyber capital of a firm? Now, so true value is one way. And then we're seeing the, the NPS, not just from customers, but from community. If you were to um, survey 
NGOs, media, youth. If you go on a college campus and you talk about this company versus the other company, what kind of reactions might you get? But these are very, very rudimentary. And as you know, any good theory will have models, methods, and measures. And the measures are early stage. Can that be done? Can we, like, for intellectual capital, we measure patents and then there is a market and you can see that you can monetize the present value of the royalties. We have no such thing that I'm aware of today for moral capital. I think this is where the research is so important and the board, let's say, at INSEAD asked me, how long, Subi? Two generations, 50 years. It takes so long because it's, you know, there are two kinds of things. There's preaching and teaching. We're still kind of at that preaching stage. To go to teaching, we need, and, and, and it's a big community, and as you know, the academy is very slow. Is like producing pharmaceuticals, you know, 10, 10, 20 years. So we're far, far from having indicators. First is just kind of conceptualizing, what does this really mean? And is this something that is collective? Is this something that is public? So I have not any good answer to your question, but I know that it's important to answer that if we want to advance the adoption of these ideas. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for sharing your, your words of wisdom with us today. I was going to ask, what leader comes to mind that has achieved this balance between performance and progress? There are many, thankfully. There are many. And I think in India, Tata Enterprise is the one that exemplifies this idea. In the United States, for a long time, IBM was the model company in integrating performance and progress. They had the first black vice president like in 1914. They had the first blind person. IBM was and the first woman CEO and IBM has been a trailblazer. Now, the company has still kind of, and Watson, when they did AI, they invested a couple of billion on Watson. And the first application was not commercial applications, but health and they wanted to focus on oncology or cancer. And unfortunately, the privacy issues blocked them from kind of creating the training models and so on. And now Watson is sold, IBM is broken up. It's So progress is not easy and it's not for the faint of heart. It's not just about caring, but you need courage. And so IBM comes to mind, but a, a leader like Mark Benioff at Salesforce. He leads with courage. He is not afraid to make choices. And whether it's on gender parity, whether it's on inclusion, whether it's on homelessness, whether it's on privacy. Um, and then in Brazil, the company that comes to mind is Natura. There are smaller companies like Patagonia, um, but Natura in Brazil, 1969, when they were founded, their motto was Bem Estar Bem, well-being well, well-being and being well. And it is from Natura and the founders that I learned about the theory of well-being and relationships. Now, again, they focus tremendously on progress, not enough on performance. So you need to, you know, I found that people have courage when they also have cash. But if you don't have cash, you know, it's very hard to save the world when you can't save yourself. That's why performance is fundamental, very important. Um, PepsiCo, under Indra Nui, who was CEO for 12 years, the way she led PepsiCo to address head on the first day when she became CEO, she said, one billion people are overweight in the world. 300 million are clinically obese. What is PepsiCo's response? Now for a CEO in the cola business to have something like that, and then go on to hire a medical doctor to be the head of R&D instead of someone who's in packaging, coloring, flavoring. And how she's transformed the portfolio of that company into 
less sodium, less sugar, directly addressing, you know, what is SOG, which is strategy, operations, governance. You have to change the strategy, the operations, the governance. Apple is an amazing example of a company that tries to do this. Apple hired a philosopher in 2011 who's still there with them. His name is Josh Cohen. 2011, Apple hires a real philosopher. He's a, 25 years at MIT, 10 years at Stanford, and now 10 years at Apple, helping them just understand what is the morality of this technology and how, when to release the Apple Watch or not, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the examples. I think to a certain extent, Tesla and Elon Musk could fit this mold. In fashion, Stella McCartney, definitely. Um, so like this, there are, the, the, if, if you want to look at an industrial enterprise, a B2B business, in Sweden, there is a company called Linden Gruppen. L-I-N-D-E-N, Linden is the family name. And Jenny Linden is the sole owner of this company. It's a two billion euro enterprise, industrial enterprise. The way she is transforming is a 200 year old companies. They're world leaders in 30 countries. And how they're addressing issues of carbon, safety, gender, and how they are measuring it. So Linden has, is the most advanced in measurement and reporting. And it's a private company, but they measure and report everything, and they have somehow monetized. They call it impact-weighted accounting. So there's a lot of work going on, but they don't call it, that's the true value model. So if you go to the Linden Group and website and type true value, you will see how they measure their integration of performance and progress in one simple frame. And it's all in dollars. So they've converted, they've monetized everything. And they give the methodology in that. And it's a public open source. They want to share it. They want more companies to adopt their, and they're saying this is a work in progress. Please help us improve this. So those are the kind of companies. I know we're really out of yes, time. Yes, maybe many... we can take the last sure. uh, question from the screen. So it says younger members are more attuned about sustainability, but sometimes it's a challenge to be able to get the older generations on board. Suggestions. So... I think this is a big deal. And I think, you know, what I've learned again through research is we are underestimating governance. We focus on the E and the S, but we don't really talk much about the G, the ESG. And this governance, if we don't respect it, then we will not get everybody on board. So I told you that what's important in life is choices. But in enterprises and in the economy, it's not just a private choice, it's a collective choice. And you need to get other people on board. Whatever the issue you choose to care about, if you can't get other people on board, you may feel your you know, you may feel good, but you will not do good. So if we want to avoid just feeling good, but we actually want to do good, you have to engage with this collective. Now, what did I realize about this? So take an example like Larry Fink at BlackRock. Larry Fink said, okay, ESG, this is the thing. I'm the big investor and you better do this or else I will screen you out. And suddenly over the last two or three years, there's been a huge backlash on BlackRock. 24 states have said, we will not give you our pension fund money, etc. What did Larry Fink miss? There are, there is the ethics, and then there is the economics. We have to understand the economics. I can't come and tell you to sacrifice your job or your livelihood to save the planet. If I don't have an alternative for you, it is immoral for me to say, you know, you're in the oil and gas industry, just quit. You're a coal miner, just stop. What will you do? You, have, you didn't even finish high school. You're 50 years old. There are no other jobs here. And to save the planet, I'm gonna give up my livelihood. Now, the key thing here is not just the ethics or the economics, 
it's the emotions. And the emotions have to be addressed through dialogue. If I'm going to come and ask you to do something that you don't believe, or you believe will harm you, not it may help the world, but it'll harm you, I need to engage, exchange, and repeat, explain. If I don't engage with you on an emotional level, so for example, in the US IRA, there's $2 trillion for the green transition. Much of this will be solar and wind. We have the technology, we have the money, but now we need the land. We need the land from farmers or people who own that land. And they're saying, I don't want windmill on my land. Yeah, I understand green transition. I don't want to see solar panels. I love my view. Mayors of cities are having to work with family by family to explain, please, I need you to make this sacrifice. I understand that you, your view will be spoiled. Here are the other alternatives. This is the best one and here's why. I can't just say, this is, the world needs climate change. Al Gore told me, you know, that it's truth and you're the one who faces the inconvenience. Too bad. Let's go. How much? We need to engage with people where they are and it may take 10 years longer you know like the african proverb you want to walk fast walk alone you want to walk far walk together we need to walk far we need to walk together which means we need to compromise which means and that's why obama versus biden biden is much better at compromise he's like okay it's not about who's right. It's what can you do today? Can you do this much? Can you, let's, let's move rather than let's just get the whole thing. So my advice to you is engage, exchange with respect, address the emotions, not just the ethics, address the economics, not just the ethics. If we do not address the economics and the emotions along with the ethics, Chances are we will feel good, but not do good. And too many people think, oh, if you are um, right wing or if you care about money, you're a bad person. I think this is uh, not helpful and not morally right either. So dialogue, dialogue, maybe you learn something, maybe you change your mind and don't be afraid to compromise. Um, and once you start talking, so that's what I would say. Thank you so much, Professor Rangan, and thank you everyone for being with us today. Uh, we hope we can be an ally for you to improve the wealth management, but at the same time to engage and, uh, and to maximize or optimize not only your economic value, but your social and environmental. And thank you for being here. And again, thank you, Professor Rangan. I, I have a question for this group. Does anything what I said make any sense to you? Or are you like, this is completely crazy, and I wish I were having coffee and a glass of wine? Seriously, does it make any sense? Should I continue this research or not? Or stop now before I waste more time? Yours and mine. What do you think? Does, does it make any sense? Should I, I'll ask you a simple question. Should I continue this research? Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I release you. We're going to share a cup of coffee.